Okay, we are going to get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's CNCF webinar, Managing Your Policies and Standards. I'm Jerry Fallon, and I will be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter today, Ahmad, Ahmed Badran, Chief Technology <clears throat> Chief Technology Officer at Megalix. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or, que or questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Please be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. And please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ahmed for today's presentation. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, we'll get started here. Thanks everyone for joining. I know it's a bit early for some of you. Uh, so today we'll, we'll be talking about managing policies and standards. Uh, we'll dig deep uh, into that uh, to see what that means. Um, but mainly really, we're gonna be talking about two key uh, technologies here that are open source part of the CNCF, which is Rego uh, OPA, as well as Gatekeeper. Um, so just a little bit about me before we get started and talk about the, the, this topic today. Uh, so my name is Ahmed Badran. I'm, I'm the CTO at Megalix, which is a startup uh, that's about three years old now, uh, specializes in kind of this area of governance uh, and the operational excellence for people joining, kind of going through the journey for cloud native. Uh, prior to that, I, I, I did uh, uh, a while, uh, some time ago at Amazon AWS, uh, back in the day when, uh, when all of AWS team used to fit actually in one floor in one building. Uh, now they occupy almost uh, a big chunk of Seattle. Uh, went between different companies and it was interesting going through kind of the journey myself, kind of this cloud native journey even before the term existed, uh, which is kind of what many of, of people now going through as they migrate kind of their legacy infrastructures and, and system and the monolith into this new world. So let's jump into that and kind of talk about really you know, some of those cloud native challenges kind of to, to create the context and background before we start talking about policies and standards and, and why should we even care? <clears throat> so when you think about kind of the, the old world of, of especially monolith uh, where you have this single kind of big uh, monolithic app where all your requests come in. So operationally, it has some interesting characteristics to it. You know, it's simple to deploy, it's one thing, but also it's a little bit of a challenge because you get a lot of, of um, you know, different components of your system in the same application. One part fails, everything kind of fails. Uh, it, it's either one or all. And then as people start migrating kind of to the, to the microservices architecture, uh, and then started kind of adopting the DevOps kind of methodologies with these, changes and this kind of uh, journey that people are going through come also some challenges. One of the key things here that people maybe sometimes don't realize until they're really into you know, the full implementation and productionization of their new microservices architecture is as you distribute your architecture and divide the responsibilities, you're also dividing and distributing your problems. You're trying basically to decentralize the decision-making in your system. And that comes with its own little bit of, you know, little bit of unease, especially in the operational side, because I used to have one thing that I know how to deploy. Now I have so many different things that I have to kind of make sure I'm aligned with the dev teams and how these different things should be deployed. Uh, there is now many different ways of, of people configuring their services, setting up things, and definitely the containerization uh, evolution, revolution, if you may, uh, helped with that standardization a little bit, uh, but also different teams have different ways of doing uh, the, the, their thing, their setup, their configuration. Um, so it creates a bit of that tension between the developers and the operator, because at the end of the day, the reason we move to the microservices, the whole cloud native promise is that agility. We wanna move fast. We wanna be able to iterate on a lot of innovative idea as a business and 
<clears throat> that's why you separate kind of you, you, you decentralize your decision making and you let kind of your your development team kind of be creative, innovative and move without having to kind of synchronize everything in a single monolith or a single, uh, even organizationally, you become agile and you become distributed. And that's kind of what the development team want to kind of, you know, uh, push forward with. In the operational side, you still care about stability and the operational excellence of your infrastructure and your production environment. Now, there comes this tension where engineers want to move fast, but then operators and the operation team want to make sure, you know, things follow certain rules and standards. So it's not a zoo. Everyone, uh, everyone needs to play a good citizen of this distributed infrastructure. We all share those resources. You know, one application running away with their memory or their CPU, just impacting somebody else is, is not a good thing. So there comes this tension, I and mean, it's obviously not a good thing to have uh, your two, your devs and ops kind of not on the same page. That's the opposite of the dev op kind of, you know, culture you want to embed. You want people to be working together and synchronizing uh, uh, or, or kind of synergizing the, their effort to really solve the business problems as opposed to be fighting. You don't want your operation team to be the bottleneck trying to review every change that goes out to make sure, you know, everybody's following whatever the standard is. Uh, so where, where does these standards or policies come from? Well, those could be best practices established by your team. They could be tribal knowledge you've built over time of how you want to name, maybe having a naming convention for your services or, or, or what, what have you. Or it could be security related uh, configuration and best practices you want to follow. Or depending on what industry you are in, that could be compliance. Uh, so uh, regulatory, legal things you must kind of, you know, uh, check the boxes for. Again, it's not it's not a you know a problem that is only a few people face it. It's everybody probably going through the journey. They go through that and they struggle through that. Now, this is just one of those challenges. I'm not trying to kind of say this is the only challenge people, you know, move into the cloud native, uh, you know, paradigm is, is facing. But this is certainly one interesting one that tend to, to slow down and kind of uh, you know kind of beat its head a bit as people kind of doing migration and, and people kind of hit it a little bit late in the game sometimes if they haven't thought about it because you're trying to move fast you, you, you this microservices you know you need all the technical things and it's like you know this is this is utopia at the end of the of the tunnel but uh, uh, you end up facing some of these kind of really practical challenges that's going to hit you that affect your culture and, and could really impede your progress so what are we going to cover today what is their objective you know, so we'll talk about a little bit about what is this governance, uh, which I kind of kind of alluded to as, you know, how do you come up with a way for all of us to be good citizen of this new distributed world that we're going to live in? Uh, so we'll talk about that, how to establish, how to think a little bit about that kind of governance framework. And then we'll, we'll, we'll look at, uh, you know, simple, but, but kind of uh, uh, descriptive examples of just kind of uh, open policy agent, what it does and kind of the legal language. Uh, and also we'll address a little bit about Gatekeeper, which is something uh, that has been in the making for some time now, but it's kind of, you know, uh, uh, becoming more productionized uh, than, uh, than before. So, and we'll, we'll even look at some examples of policies in Kubernetes uh, that you can utilize. Now, and instead of making this just kind of a very abstract, actually, I'll go through a true story that happened to us at Magalix and, and kind of how we went through and use that as a motivation to kind of really walk you through kind of the workflow of the process and how we ended up uh, doing what we're doing and hopefully you learn from that as well. So one day, uh, one of our SREs uh, had this message in Slack. There was this workload running in our uh, uh, dev environment and he didn't know what it was. He was doing some changes and he needed to, to change something and, and he, he needed to change the configuration of this thing. And he wasn't sure who owns it because he needed to talk to them. Is this is, you know, is my change again going to affect you? You know, I'm, I'm not, I don't know who's, who's this thing is. And it took a bit for people to reply. Now, could this have been a malicious thing? You don't want to wait too long to know what's going on. Should, should we shut it down? Uh, you know, who should we contact? Maybe it is something in production or, or something of, of critical. Now this was dev, uh, but assume this was production, you know, as an SRE, you don't want to shut down something that maybe is, a, is part of some big feature going on or, or something just you, you happen not to be aware of. Uh, so that delay, you know, causes problems. 
Uh, and you really want to get an answer maybe to something like this very quickly. And we thought about it a little bit. Eventually, we knew who, who it was. And it was some, somebody prototyping something um, as part of some new feature we were working on. Uh, so we figured that out. But then you know, what, what you want to always learn as part of any operational excellence uh, you know, framework you have, you want to be able to prevent issues. You reflect on those sort of problems. It's just a simple one. But you can think of this as a security violation somebody found somewhere. And, I need somebody to fix that very quickly. You know, should we then block all developers and force something like everybody should put an owner name maybe for, for every application that is deployed in our, on our Kubernetes infrastructure? Uh, you know, how are we gonna do this? Are we gonna force a PR and, and like have the SRE manually review all of this? Uh, you know, there's gotta be a better way. And usually the better way has to do something with automating the process. Uh, so let's call this the, the owner label problem. Like we thought about it, it's like, what, what if we have a best practice or a standard in our organization that says, you know, every workload you deploy must have a label that has the owner name, or that could be an email of the team that owns that service. Uh, so at least we know who to contact or who to talk to. Uh, you know, you can think of, you can extend this, you know, maybe you should have also a link to the GitHub uh, where the service uh, code at. Uh, maybe you can have a link to a, a Wikipedia a wiki page in your internal organization to describe maybe something a bit more about this. So uh, if somebody want to learn about it. So whatever it may be, and you can extend this just simple idea of owner label. But at the end of the day, how do you enforce this? How do you make sure everybody's playing a good citizen without blocking the productivity of, you know, the engineers want to move fast and move quick, but still you want to provide this level of kind of checks and balances to ensure a common standards across the organization to make really your life easy down the line in production. So this is really kind of a governance problem in a way. So when we're thinking about it here is, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's the idea of policy as code. Now we can write a document, we can have this in the onboarding, we can, we can have emails going out about this new policy, but that's probably not a good scalable, sustainable solution. Uh, you really want to think of just like infrastructure as code, you want to have policy as code. Uh, so what is governance, at least in, in the way we, we, I'm defining it here, it's, it's the ability of the operation team to verify and enforce certain policies and standards across the entire organization, or maybe a, a subset, or a certain cluster, or a set of clusters, or a set of workloads that meet certain criteria. Whatever it may be, your ability to enforce certain things and be able to do that automatically in a, in a, you know, in a productive manner uh, is, is what I'm referring to uh, as the governance framework. So there is kind of three things usually when you want to think about establishing your, your policies. Uh, first, what, what is your target? So in this example, uh, we have in this particular case, the, the, the target here would be really workloads, any workloads. So not ingress, not services, not volume, just kind of any object that is a workload. So controllers, you can, you can make it more specific. Maybe you care about stateful sets more than uh, certain other things or, or, or maybe uh, certain objects in Kubernetes that have a certain uh, annotation. Uh, whatever it may be, you need to kind of for any given policy, you wanna kind of define what is the target and then you wanna define the actual policy. The policy is the set of rules you wanna enforce. In our particular example is anything that is missing an owner label is a violation of our policy. So I wanna check, I wanna ensure that, that every workload controller being deployed to my Kubernetes cluster has a owner label. The last thing you wanna think about also is, is the trigger. Uh, how do you do this check? Is it something you do once a day, once a week, kind of a, on a schedule type? Uh, is it something you do uh, at deployment time? So in your Kubernetes, like something like admission control, for those of you familiar with admission control. So you do it at deployment time, so you prevent the deployment. Any deployment of a workload that violates this policy, is that when you want to enforce the policy? Or could you do it even earlier, like moving to the left, thinking about uh, your build time, your, your CI phase, or even your commit, your git commit phase. Can you enforce it at that level? You know, the more you move to the left, the better because your developers, your engineers will, will get kind of the feedback early and hopefully solve a problem before it's, it's you know, they, they're in the middle of a deployment and now things are failing and now they have to go modify some code or update 
some files and go through the CI CD again. Uh, <clears throat> so, so those roughly are the three elements you want to think about when you're thinking about a policy. For our case, uh, I want to enforce this on all workloads in our Kubernetes cluster for, for our dev and, and prod environment, so two clusters. And the policy is I want to make sure every workload, the spec has a label called owner with some text inside. And the trigger, we were fine every 24 hours, just once a day. I just want to get a report about it. And then I'll go harass the people. And then maybe later we can we can make it a little bit more dynamic and maybe enforce it at, uh, at build time, which would be awesome. Fail the build if something violates this policy. <clears throat> All right, so uh, let's talk about open policy agent, which is the first thing that should come to mind probably when you're thinking about enforcing policies uh, in an automated manner. So the open policy agent is an interesting. So it's part of the CNCF. Uh, it's a CNCF project, and I think it's uh, they just filed for for graduation. Um, so it's a great tool to allow you to to uh, you know your organization to define these custom policies uh, and be able to run them. Now the the OPA itself is just kind of like a policy execution engine, and it uses a language called Rigo, uh, which is kind of the policy language. So we'll talk about it in a bit. Uh, but really, what, what it comes down to is uh, let's talk about kind of the case when you're deploying things. So you make a request to Kubernetes, you're trying to deploy something, uh, update something. Uh, what, let's say in a mission control case, uh, that change will go and your OPA uh, could intercept that and then respond, evaluate basically the policies associated with this change uh, and then enforce, say, you know, deny or, or accept or deny this change. Uh, so, so this is roughly kind of the paradigm. The idea is I have a policy and I have an object that is being changed. And what the OPA is kind of will take these two and tell you yes or no, deny or allow. Is, is this change, does this, does this object uh, checks the, the boxes, check the list for these poli this policy or these policies, maybe you have a list of them. Uh, does it violate any of those? If not, then you know, you're good to go. If, uh, if uh, yes, it violates then that's a deny. Uh, so that's really just kind of a high level, the essence of it. Uh, but how you deploy it and, and the architecture of it is something we're going to talk, talk about in a bit because there's different ways. Um, and that kind of depends on the triggers, right? So if you think about it, the OPA here gives you obviously a policy execution engine. Uh, so that by itself uh, doesn't decide really the other things like the triggers or, or the policy. The policy you're going to define with Rigo, uh, the Rigo language. The, the where to enforce it is another thing we're going to talk about. And then the, the, the triggers is when to enforce it uh, is the other one. So let's start with just the policy itself. Now, how do you describe a policy using kind of the OPA? Well, there is the Rigo language, which is a declarative language. And I just made a very simple here policy. Uh, again, I just checked that the label exists. It doesn't even check what the value is. You can, you can make it more complex. There is a lot. I, 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 won't be going into details of how Rigo works or, or, or some of this. Uh, there's a lot of resources online to help with that, but I just want to get you the flavor and just put it all into kind of one end-to-end -end framework so you can see how it all works. And then each piece of these, you probably could dig more. So this is the simplest one. Now, Rigo is just basically statements, like assertion statements that you evaluate to true or false. Even uh, an, uh, uh, an assignment statement is, is evaluated, but it, it gets evaluated to true by default. But everything else is, is almost like a, you know, a conditional statement of a sort and, and then it gets evaluated to true or false. Everything is true, that's a pass. Something is false anywhere, well, that's false. The whole evaluation of the policy becomes false. Uh, <clears throat> so if you look at it here, there is input dot metadata dot labels. Now input is, is kind of this object that is given to you by the, the kind of the legal language that maps maps to the object that is being passed to you. Uh, so the OPA kind of handles that and kind of assign the object that comes to it to, to this input uh, variable. And then this is the spec of a, of a workload uh, of a controller object in Kubernetes. So dot metadata dot labels. And then you can access, you can, you're looking basically for an owner uh, label inside of that uh, YAML JSON structure. And if it's not there, <clears throat> uh, you know, that, that, that will evaluate uh, basically to deny. Let, let's actually show you, if, if you haven't, 
there is something called the Rigo Playground, uh, and it's it's available there. Uh, I think the URL is, is uh, uh, regoplayground.org. Uh, I should have put the link here. Uh, it's easy to find out. But let's have here is the policy to to your left as you see, and then to the right I just put an example. Uh, again, this is not the full spec of, a, of an actual object, but this is just kind of a, a part of it, uh, and. Uh, you can see, so this one doesn't have an owner label, it has another label, uh, so deny equal true. <clears throat> because this statement ended up evaluating to true, so when you click evaluate, you'll see kind of the output here, deny if it's true. Uh, this is another example where there is an owner and now there's nothing coming back. So what you see here is just kind of how the OPA would evaluate these policies. And, and honestly, it, it's up to you, the deny versus the allow, uh, how you want to structure, because you will interpret the result. Uh, and we'll maybe talk about the deployment so you kind of maybe see how, how would you deploy this? So how you, would you interpret this result? Uh, so there's three ways really to deploy kind of OPA. <clears throat> One is just use the Go uh, uh, as a library, really. Just use the Go uh, module and, and write your code, just like this this example here. So you know there's a Rego dot you know new, and you create a query, and and you can parse and evaluate, um, assuming that Rego is in a file called example dot Rego. But you also could deploy it. OPA comes uh, you know as a container, and you, and you can deploy it as a container inside of a pod. And, and then your application can call that pod, maybe pass it the object it, it comes and then do something with it. And OPA also could be, you could configure it so it receives, you know, just as a full pod by itself, like in the third example here, and, and it has its own uh, URL and you can create a service for it and, and you can just kind of, you know, OPA as a service, uh, you, you maintain that. Now, what we decided actually in our case is we just went with the Go library because we wanted really full control of, of, of creating our own service and you know, getting the object and, and interpreting that result, uh, the deny. You know, we wanted also a standard within our organization of how we want to write those policies, like uh, those assertion rules. The word deny is just a rule, and you can create whatever you want. And it doesn't have to be like we said. <clears throat> it really works in any object. If it's a JSON, it could work on it. It doesn't have to be a Kubernetes uh, object, like in our particular example. So it definitely extends beyond the the one example I'm showing you here, but um, there's a lot of uh, options, but the ones we went with, at least for our case, because we wanted to, to really have a kind of a standard within our organization to do this and, and, and also help even our customers with this. Uh, so we went with um, uh, basically writing our own service and uh, using the, the OPA Go library um, to do this. But again, at the end of the day, you just need the policy, you need the object. And then the OPA is just a, a policy execution engine. There is no magic to it. How you write the policies, how you want to interpret the result, uh, that's basically up to you. So this is something that is not part of OPA itself. You know, it's just the policy execution engine. So how do you manage your policy? So these are some of the things that are missing with OPA, the vanilla OPA. You know, where do you put those policies? How do you manage them? Uh, when do you run it? You know, somebody has to call this. Uh, even if you run OPA as a service, you don't write your own, somebody has to call that service to do this. Um, and that gets us maybe into some other ways <clears throat> uh, to trigger this, which is really gatekeeper. Gatekeeper is, is, is the kind of a, uh, an extendable parameterized policy library uh, that I think now is V3 and it's still in beta, uh, but there's a lot of contribution from a lot of people. And I think it's picking up uh, some good steam here. And it tried to address some of those shortcomings or basically uh, adds to the OPA so you get kind of uh, the full framework of a policy as code. Because like you saw there, you can write a policy, but where do you manage it? Where do you keep it? The other thing is when do you trigger it? Who's gonna do the triggering now? Do, like in our case, we ended up writing a service and uh, you know, we decided to you know, do some events and when something changes, I will, I will call the service to kind of validate, you know, verify the, the policies at work and is, you know, is that change that somebody made violates any of our policies or not? <clears throat> so Gatekeeper really tried to address is this. And uh, let's see, hopefully the next slide is, is, is 
the example, but let's talk about just kind of uh, the architecture of it. Uh, so it uses OPA. It just kind of, a, you think of it as a layer on top of OPA. Uh, it, it will run like an agent in your cluster and it will register itself as a, an admission controller. All right, and what about the policies? Well, the policies will be uh, custom resource definitions. So they have the resource definition. It's not just the Rego now. So you create a policy, which is gonna be its own YAML kind of you know, object that is a CRD. So you will persist it just like, you know, you can use the, the kubectl command and just like you create and apply any objects in your, in your Kubernetes cluster. So that's how we do manage those policies. And then gatekeeper will be, uh, <clears throat> will register itself a web hook with the admission control. So any changes that happens in your cluster you will get kind of an admission uh, request or an admission review request. <clears throat> so this is the triggering mechanism, like we were thinking about the, 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 the uh, governance framework. And then we'll talk about actually how you do the, the, the targeting with this, but basically the gatekeeper will get any change uh, from the API server and the webhook, and it will run the policies, the relevant policies, and then we'll give you an admission review, deny, allow. So what does these CRDs look like? <clears throat> well, there's, you basically create a template, which is this kind of example on the left, what, what, what's called constraint templates. And all you see there is really the rego, you write your rego. So the missing labels or, or what have you. And also you can define variables, and that's a very powerful, uh, aspect because again that's what makes this a template is, is you write it once and then you can verify because sometimes I know I called it owner uh, label maybe you want to call it something else or maybe I have different uh, uh, in the databases they want to call it something or, or my services for application or workloads that my team owns I want to call it some owner but maybe for third-party uh, workloads like databases we just get or from from you know third party uh, we want to use a different label <clears throat> But it's really the same policy here, the same template. And you can have what is called constraint, which we have an example here on the right, where you kind of plug the variables you want, the, the exact value for the variables. And also this is where you get to define your targeting. <clears throat> so if you look to the constraint here on the right, uh, the parameters here label is owner. And you can see I, I'm, I'm for, for this particular case, I have it uh, target uh, kind deployment. So deployment objects is where I'm gonna run this policy. So you see here now the gatekeeper is providing the targeting with what you see here and also a decent way to manage those policies we talked about. So it's not just creating the policies using the review, but also a way to manage those policies. And because it registers itself, you deploy it as an agent and it registers itself. Now uh, the triggering will be anytime something changes, uh, you will get a trigger and gatekeeper will do the magic for you. We'll find the objects, <clears throat> uh, whatever the object that's being changed, we'll find the policies that matches that object and then we'll run them. And then we'll, we'll kind of give you the, the result, the deny allow kind of uh, admission response. Uh, so you can you can try like this example here where we have something that was missing the owner label. <clears throat> and you see just when you're trying to do a bad deployment, uh, you, you get this error from server denied by must have owner. And, uh, you know, it tell you the error creating this admission webhook, and, you know, the gatekeeper and, and so on. <clears throat> Just look at what I'm doing all the time. So uh, I just talked about one example like this uh, owner label, but but obviously there's other ways, other things you can do, uh, you can create policies for. You know, you can check for readiness probes and liveness probes. You know, that's just a good practice. Every workload you have, uh, every container you have should should really have those uh, liveness probes and readiness probes, you know, the services. <clears throat> uh, you can obviously also enforce certain uh, just basic security like hygiene, good hygiene, like allow privilege escalation, uh, must run as non-root. Uh, you can maybe enforce certain things like, you know, workloads, you know, all your services should have at least two replicas just for, for full tolerance. So if one fails or one node has an issue, you know, you have another replica. Affinity, pod anti-affinity uh, is another thing. Making sure your pods 
you know, your multiple replica of your, your workload is not, are not deployed to the same node. So that node goes down. Now your whole service goes down, even though you have two replicas, but they both ended up in the same node. That's not good. Uh, Role binding, container images, checking, you know, the, uh, you know, making sure you're only getting your images from trusted uh, uh, repositories um, and so on and so forth. These are just kind of very simple, basic examples, but I'm sure you can come up with more. You can come up with your own as well that kind of makes sense for also for your own organization. <clears throat> Uh, this is a bit continuing with kind of the, the gatekeeper because when, once you do the run, it actually, the status part of, you know, when you do the scribe for, for your Kubernetes uh, constraint object, uh, you will actually see the status. <clears throat> so it kind of gives you an audit and a status of, uh, especially when you create that uh, constraint for the first time, it will kind of do a quick run for you and show you all the uh, things that uh, were denied or would have been denied. Basically objects you have that were really are in violation of your policy. Um, so uh, to kind of really wrap it up before I even talk about kind of, you know, let's just finish with this. So, so there is also metrics, you know, Gatekeeper really, I think take kind of the OPA and, and kind of the, the concepts of the Regu, like these basic building blocks and try to put it together uh, and provide this, uh, tool really that, that will help you then implement this kind of governance framework that, that we were talking about. Because uh, the idea is you need a way to target the changes of the objects you wanna, you, wanna, you wanna enforce your policies against. And then you wanna define your policies, which means also you need a way to manage them and put them somewhere. And then you need a way to trigger those policies, to trigger those checks. Uh, now Gatekeeper does it just kind of with admission control. If you need to do other things, again, OPA is a, a open source, but also they have a nice Go uh, library. So you can just use the code and write your own service, which is kind of the case we've done. Uh, we also look it into, into Gatekeeper. It's, it's still in, in, in kind of the development phase, really. There is, uh, I, I know some people maybe are adopting, but I think the constraint and the template, the constraint template and the constraint framework that's created uh, definitely move us forward in that path. <clears throat> so now you can see, kind of the end-to-end -end story here. You have a policy, you discover some issue in your environment uh, where we needed everybody to play as, you know, be a good citizen of this distributed environment. In this case, just having an owner label or whatever other operational excellence, best practices you might have. <clears throat> you take that, you codify it with code. So using Rego to make your policy as code, as opposed to just kind of like an email that somebody would send or or, or something you put in some like onboarding handbook that probably nobody will follow. So now you are enforcing your policy as code, <coughs> which really give you this kind of uh, automated uh, ability to, to ensure kind of good hygiene, good operational excellence, good stability of your production environment without putting a lot of strain on the developers and slowing them, slowing them down and impacting kind of the agility of the whole process. And thus, you as, as both DevOps, kind of the devs and the ops, really focusing more on the interesting problems of the business and really focusing on the value for the things you wanna do for your business as opposed to kind of fighting and enforcing and who missed that and you know, the dev, you know, the ops team doing just like code reviews or PRs or trying to really chase developers to make sure you know, everybody's following the policy. Um, so, so with that, really, I concluded kind of the webinar, and I'm, I'm happy to, to answer questions. It was just kind of brief high-level overview, kind of looking at Rego, OPA, and Gatekeeper, and how can you kind of put them together uh, with kind of a specific kind of problem just to motivate the discussion. Uh, so with that, thank you, and uh, I return in the back. Gary? Thank you, Ahmed, for a wonderful presentation. We have plenty of time for questions. So if you have anything you would like to ask, please feel free to drop um, your questions into the Q&A box and we will get to as many as we can.
Do we have anyone at all? Many people probably haven't slept <laughs> since last night. So everything, I guess, was clear as mud. Okay, so we have a question here. Could you give a bit more back uh, background information on Gatekeeper? Sure, yeah. So, so Gatekeeper, <clears throat> so it is also a CNCF project. It is really built on top of the, um, it uses OPA. Uh, so it is open source and you can definitely find it and they have nice tutorials. Uh, but what it is at the end of the day is, is, is an agent you deploy and it registers itself uh, as an admission control. So what admission control is, if you're not familiar with that, it just um, the API server allow, uh, allow you to register a controller with it and register a webhook. And when something changes, it will send you kind of a request to the webhook where you respond to it. So it is called an admission request and it passes you the object that is being changed, uh, kind of the old and the new object, and you get to decide if you allow this change to happen or not. So how would you allow it or, or how would you evaluate it? Well, you have the object coming in. Now you have maybe policies defined. Uh, they are being defined kind of like uh, those C CRDs, like the constraint template and the template, like the example we show. So the gatekeeper will automatically be reading those um, and watching them and evaluate those policies against the change. And the admission response is either basically allow or deny, uh, true or false in a way. And if it is false, it will kind of fail the deployment. So whoever is running the kubectl command or, or what have you will see a failure like the example here we showed. You will get kind of an error like this. So if I'm doing this deployment and basically I, I'm, I have this uh, YAML spec and it doesn't have the label, when you run the, the kubectl command, the API server, obviously everything go to the API server. It notices that somebody is trying to change some, some object and it knows that there is this gatekeeper who's registered as, a, uh, as an admission controller. So it will send it a request, an admission request, basically asking, should I allow this change to go through or not? And then because I have a constraint, constraint template and a constraint that has this owner label policy, the gatekeeper will evaluate using OPA, will evaluate that policy against this change and deny it because it doesn't have the owner label. So, so kind of high level, that's really kind of what's happening behind the scene and that's what Gatekeeper is. Uh, it is currently V3, uh, if I remember beta, I mean, uh, there's a lot of people contributing to that project. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of see how, how it matures and, and when it becomes kind of production ready. I know some people probably already have it in, in production, uh, but, but there's some really good active development on it. So I encourage people to, to try it out. <clears throat> Sorry about that, I was on mute. Uh, do we have any other questions at all?
Okay, so if no one has any other questions, I think we will wrap it up. I want to thank Ahmed again for a wonderful presentation um, and for taking time out of his day to join us today. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today as well. As I said before, today's recording and slides will be on the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. That just about does it for everything else. Um, thank you all again for attending. Everyone take care, stay safe, and we will see you at the next webinar. Take care, everyone. Thank you.